Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming. Today is my birthday. Happy birthday. But I love you so much that I'm here to celebrate this day in your company. We'll make it fun. Yes. Can you sing happy birthday in Italian? I'm afraid not. <laughs> Today we're going to review passages that are particularly relevant for our understanding of Machiavellianism from chapters 17 through 20 of The Prince. And this is what we will find a lot. In some ways, the topics of these chapters overlap a lot. These chapters seem to be repetitious, redundant, but we know that the, Machi the Machiavelli's Prince is not a standard conventional treatise. So part of this repetitious style comes from the fact that as much as Machiavelli is trying to be pragmatic and logical, you always find behind the writing of these pages some passions or obsessions, some things that Machiavelli cares so much about that he goes back to some of the same topics a lot. You also find a contradictory approach. And this comes from the attempt at condensating in a few pages a complex system. So the apparent contradictions are the result of the fact that there is a complex dynamic interaction between some of the concepts introduced by Machiavelli. And some of these concepts are too modern, have not been absorbed yet. It's the early stages of a modern way of thinking. So it's brilliant, but it's incomplete. It's convincing, but sometimes it's more emotional than logical in the way of argument. Okay. So what we find here, some of the same things we've observed before, since everything is related to a context, nothing has a universal value, and therefore you will see over and over again Machiavelli oscillating when it comes to defining the value of something whether something, a behavior, or anything such as the use of fortresses is positive or negative. Clearly, he is non-committal because it depends on the context. And sometimes Machiavelli almost comes out and says that, but there is some ambiguity. And because of this, of course, you also see a lot of exceptions. And it's important to remark those things because Otherwise, you do what plenty of readers have done through the centuries. Just stop at st sentences where Machiavelli seems to be committing to a position on some things. And they try to extract sayings, mottos, proverbs from the prince. And that approach really has no value because we know that Machiavelli is against any generalization. And I'm saying that because I had the opportunity to see the second video of the interview by Michael Francis, former mob member of uh, the Colombo family, and then I don't remember which other family he works for, uh, with Charles Palminteri, uh, the actor and the author of the script on which a Bronx tale was based. And they do that especially Palminteri, he takes sentences out of the prints. In fact, he makes a wonderful soup of everything we've studied because he ends up attributing in this interview to Machiavelli things we found in the 48 Laws of Power, such as never outshine the master. He doesn't at attribute that to um, uh, Robert Greene. He alleges that, he, he assumes that that is found in the prince, which, which is not true. You might find examples where that is understood, but 
clearly that is not purely Machiavelli. Machiavelli in these chapters will insist a lot on the relationship between love and fear, meaning he'll go back and redefine that or repropose that idea with an apparent uh, emphasis on fear, which is not entirely sincere because it has to be placed in a uh, larger context and also he insists a lot on avoiding hatred and you have to make sure that you understand the concept of hatred in connection to the recurring references to the recurring uh, suggestions recommendations to the prince not to touch the property of the subjects of the citizens not to touch their women and in one of those passages, he'll explain that this is a matter of honor and reputation, right? It's not a matter of familial bonds or romantic uh, protection, uh, the man protecting the woman. And finally, in the last chapter of today, he will also talk about the weapons of those individuals. Now, these, uh, these repeated references to this, in my opinion, are a primitive, rudimentary attempt at defining a concept of which we are very well aware as people of the 21st century, but it was still a concept that was still uh, roughly understood in Machiavelli's time, which is the basic social and political distinction between public and private. Meaning that this is the private context of the individuals which should not be encroached by the prince because that could cause a reaction, right? A reaction that goes from hatred to opposition or insurrection, conspiracy, we'll also mention in this chapters. In reference to the two concepts of force and influence, Machiavelli will be ambivalent and go back and forth in these chapters between emphasizing force, which is expected based on every other chapter of The Prince, and emphasizing influence. Because even when Machiavelli is talking about force, and for example, he's saying that men, uh, that leaders have to be half men, half beasts. And among the animals, they have to study the fox and the lion, where the fox represents, of course, cunning and therefore influence, and lion represents force, power. Lion, the lion was often an emblem of government, right, of kingdoms in Europe. But then, when Machiavelli uh, actualizes the example of the lion, first it says, you have to be the fox to see the traps, right? The fox can escape more than other animals. And in fact, you find a whole literature about this from the 16th, the 17th, the 18th century. Just think of fox hunting in England. Why hunt the fox in particular? And well, into the 19th century, you find the idea that it is fox that we're hunting exactly because they're so smart, uh, they're so able to escape that it is more challenging than hunting for a deer or for a rabbit, for a hare, etc. So Machiavelli will say, you have to be the fox to recognize the traps. Okay, we understand that this is influence, right? It's the application of the intellect and manipulation and analysis to politics. Then he says you have to be the lion to defeat the wolves. However, what is striking is that Machiavelli does not say you have to be the lion because the lion can attack the wolves, because the lion is more powerful as an animal than the wolves. No, he says you have to be the lion to all 
the uh, walls. I believe that is the verb that is used in the translation in the Italian original version. He uses the verb sbigottire, which means to astonish, to paralyze with fear. So even in reference to the lion, which is supposed to represent force, Machiavelli doesn't imply that there is a fight, an actual physical fight between the lion and the wolves. He introduces there the concept of deterrence. You have to be the lion so that the wolves will be paralyzed at your side and go another place, right? So even force does not materialize into an actual fight, into an actual use of force. It's still indirect force, and deterrence is, after all, as we said at the beginning of the semester, deterrence is indeed a form of influence. And this is also apparent, this ambiguous treatment of force, when Machiavelli will talk about fortresses, because after all, fortresses are material evidence that force can be used, right? Together with weapons, you would expect fortresses to be a staple in the uh, reliance of the leader on force. But what is the final response about fortresses after uh, going into different directions, after not really committing to the positive or negative value of fortresses? In the end, Machiavelli will say, oh, if you're afraid of your citizens, then you should have fortresses. And this is very true, right? You go to Italy, you go to Florence, or especially other uh, towns in central and northern Italy, and you find a lot of castle-like palaces inside the cities. And then you have to wonder why inside I would expect a castle to be placed where an external enemy would invade the territory, but why in the center of a city? And this is because there was a lot of internal fighting in those medieval city-states. And those fortified palaces served the purpose of protecting a faction, a political faction, affiliated with the family living in that castle. And they needed to be fortified because at some point their political rivals would come for them. And they would call their supporters inside the fortification, inside this fortified uh, palace, and battle with their opponents uh, and, and try to resist and protect their lives and the lives of their supporters. So Machiavelli is saying, well, if you're afraid of your own citizens, then you should have fortresses. But as far as enemies are concerned, you better not have them. So Machiavelli himself, after allegedly endorsing force over influence, is saying, get rid of fortresses, right? Because for your own people, you should rely not on fortresses, it's being ironic, you should rely on appearances. And there is a lot in these chapters about taking care of your image as, as a leader, about simulating and dissimulating who you are and your qualities. And that's how ultimately you control your citizens. And what's interesting is that Machiavelli will tell you that through the manipulation of appearances and your public image, you will convince, you will con some of your citizens. Because, after all, society is all about appearances. And it's like Machiavelli is talking about our own media society. That people are, believe what they see. That's what Machiavelli is saying. And then he adds something um, very brilliant. That is to say, even those who don't believe that you are who you pretend to be, will play along. Because after all, you have power on your side and they don't have as much power as you do and therefore they'll pretend to like you, okay? Which is the kind of game, of course, that is played everywhere from a work environment 
to a small community, to your family, to society in general, right? Some pretend to, some like who's in charge, some pretend to like who's in charge simply because who's in charge has more power and, and therefore you don't want to enter into uh, a, 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 an open kind of, transparent kind of contrast, okay? In order to go more quickly through these chapters, I have created a PDF where I lifted some of the chapters, everything you see uh, in, in the regular font is quotes from Machiavelli. The few things that I italicize are my comments or summaries, and I use colors to uh, direct your attention to the key phrases, the key terms of this. So we're inside chapter 17, and this is one of the several passages through these chapters where Machiavelli is talking about love, fear, and then adding something about hatred uh, here and there. And look at the logical development of this, right? The repetition, love is held in place, fear is held in place, and then the, difference, the differences between these two conditions. In the case of love, there is a bond of obligation, right? Some kind of duty that you feel. You feel that you have to, uh, you feel compelled. That, that would be a better term. You feel compelled to love the leader, right? However, that uh, bond can be broken at every opportunity if, uh, because after all, every individual in society looks at their own interest. So utility to oneself is a reference to individual self-interest in society, which at any time can create a contrast between a citizen who's trying to comply with the government and the direction of their own lives, okay? So the, the interest of the individual may not be the interest of the state. That's what Machiavelli is saying. And in the case of punishment, clearly there is in this system an asymmetry, right? In the case of love, control, is more on the side of the individual. They control what they feel. There's this law, right? This support, this moral support. In the case of punishment, control is more on the side of the government because it's the government that administers punishment and therefore it is the government that can enforce compliance, right? And Machiavelli will say that clearly. He has a clear understanding of this. You just have to adapt the language to our own model to understand it better. Men love at their own pleasure, but fear at the pleasure of the prince, which is this kind of asymmetry that I was talking about. Love is controlled by the person who supports the government. Fear is controlled by the government itself. A wise prince must found himself on that which is his. So if you want a predictable outcome, you cannot lean on something you cannot control, such as the moral support of the citizens, not on that which belongs to other, belongs to other mean, means is in the control of others. Now, the appendix, the extension of this is, of course, careful not to lean too much onto fear, right? Not overdo the fear thing. He must only contrive to avoid hatred because if you overdo the hatred, the, the fear, then uh, fear can turn into hatred. And the next passage is about the difference between fear and hatred. So the prince must make himself feared in such a manner that although he does not acquire love, because if, if you take that route, you may not have a lot of collaborative 
behaviors from the citizens, he avoids hatred. How you do that, of course, it says they may exist together, but the way you do that, and this, in this case, I'm summarizing instead of uh, placing here the entire passage, the main concept expressed here for the first time, and then you find it repeated later in order to avoid hatred, the prince should abstain from the property of the citizens and from their and from their women. And I suggest that in order to understand this peculiar insistence on these two concepts, you rethink them as a rudimentary approach to the issue of public versus private. What is that uh, the government, what area of life and society can the government control? And what areas should be kept private and uh, where the government should abstain from any intervention. And this is a kind of social and political debate that goes on to this day, which is also reflected in different ideologies throughout the world. Now, the next passage is pure Machiavelli, right? Where Machiavelli is talking about killing, murder, in a very matter-of-fact way, right? without any consideration for anyone's pain or suffering, okay? Uh, if he, the prince, must proceed against someone's life, he should do it when there is appropriate justification and manifest cause. Meaning, if you have to kill one of your citizens, it should be clear that you're doing it because it's business, it's not personal, because it's necessary for the cause of the government, for the well-being of society, etc. Okay? And this is another way of saying, take care of your appearances, take care of your image. Even when you have someone eliminated, people should not be thinking of you as a murderer or a monster, right? They should believe that you have some kind of justification. And once again, above all, he should abstain from the property of others. So it goes back to this issue once again. In, in, a, in, a, uh, in, in a, not in a systematic way, right? That's why I was talking about Machiavelli being passionate about this, because instead of gathering all his, all his thinking about this, he goes on goes back to this over and over again without adding much to it. So it's clear he cares about this, but he cannot define more clearly the issue. Above all, he should abstain from the property of others, for men sooner forget the death of their father than the loss <coughs> of their patrimony. Keep in mind that Machiavelli operates as an intellectual, as a human being in a city-state or a signoria, if you want to use that uh, more modern term, such as Florence, that relied primarily on mercantile activities of different kinds, right? Making money was the, uh, the, the engine of social life, right? Not just the economy, but that was the occupation of the elites, of the people in Florence who were wealthy and influential. The merchants were not just involved in simple commercial transactions, but oftentimes, even when they had a manufacturing activity, even when they have a shop or shops, they would also use the profits to invest in some kind of joint venture with other merchants, right? So this was the core of the life. So when he said the property of others, another way of reading this, not just in reference to the divide between public and private, is also a way of saying, don't touch the engine of the economy and the engine of society. Otherwise, the economy will suffer and 
if, if you have that kind of behavior and you will destroy your abilities to gather later on the resources to engage in a war or in other expensive political campaigns. But this idea that you find here, men sooner forget the death of their father than the loss of their patrimony, is reminiscent of the mindset of the merchants of Florence through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. They were hugely successful, right? They were making deals with other people in Italy, with other European countries. They were one, they were a small state, but one of the wealthiest states in the whole of Europe. So this is what people in Florence lived for, making money. Okay, so this is the paradoxical statement that refers to that reality, right? The death of the father not being as important as the loss of the patrimony. Keep in mind also that taxation during this period was arbitrary, right? It was not based on the collection of public records about your property. So it was mostly done uh, by people in, in a governmental agency that uh, told you, you have to pay this amount in taxes because we think you, you can afford it. Because this is what we think you are worth, right? So a lot of conflict of interest in that area, a lot of opportunities for abuse. You could actually ruin someone in that way. Okay. Um, let me see if I, yeah, okay. I selected the next passage, uh, which is one of many historical examples that Machiavelli includes in, the, in these chapters because it connects to something we've briefly discussed, that this entire system is nice and dandy, but Machiavelli himself, who's saying, my system is not based on the world as it ought to be, it's a pragmatic system, it's based on reality as it is, goes against Machiavelli's own understanding of human nature, which is, people tend to do the same things over and over again because it is in their nature. And therefore, this inclination to do what nature predisposed you to as a practice exposes the leader to the chance of failure, right? Because if everything is based on the context, you need to be able to change and adapt to the context. And Machiavelli will say that in these chapters. But at the same time, he offers this example which contradicts what he will say later. Because uh, this Roman general, who was famous for defeating the famous uh, Carthaginian general Hannibal, this Roman general was known to be compassionate to his soldier. And Machiavelli says, since it was in his nature to be paternal, to be compassionate, to treat uh, his soldiers with benevolence. He was lucky enough uh, that that never came back to harm him. But if, if, if his military career had been longer, sooner or later, he would have met defeat, right? Because he would have applied this attitude to a context where it was inappropriate. Right. So keep that in mind, that on one side Machiavelli is saying the perfect leader needs to change to adapt. On the other is saying it is part of human nature, it is intrinsic to human nature to tend to repeat what is in your nature. And uh, in another passage it was also add what made you successful, right? You tend to apply the same kind of solution to all of the issues that you're faced with. So in this case, we have a Roman general celebrated by centuries of literature, known for his compassion, but then in one instance, you can see how this compassion produced a negative outcome. So for example, he gave license to his soldier, and as a result, 
that was immune to me. This also is a common story in Roman history, this uh, idea that mutinies in the Roman army originated from laziness. That if you want your soldiers to be obedient, to be loyal, you have to keep them occupied, you have to keep them busy even during time of peace. So for example, this is a story that is told by Roman historian Livy, but there is another famous story of a mutiny told by Tacitus in the first century of the Common Era, uh, the, the mutiny of the legions of Pannonia, which was a Roman area in the, the central eastern uh, European part of their empire, whereby, once again, an emperor dies, and to celebrate the emperor who died and the new emperor, they're allowed to have a period of rest, but this laziness, this relaxation, uh, makes them rethink their duties and they start a rebellion. They rebel against the harsh conditions of their military lives. And you find once again this idea, which is very much part of the Roman conservative ideology. Soldiers are primitive beasts, are primitive individuals, so keep them as busy as possible. Otherwise, you never know what kind of ideas they'll get into their minds if you let them idle and think, right? And notice what is the remedy to this. And notice here too the ambivalence of Machiavelli. And Machiavelli seems to like a leader who does everything by himself. But that kind of leader, Cesare Borgia, in the end was responsible for his own failure. What is the correction here? And you can rethink the conclusion of chapter seven with this in mind, to have some other kind of group correcting the approach of this leader. So in the case of General Scipio, this nature of his being compassionate would with time have dishonored the fame and glory of Scipio, would have made him fail if he had persevered in it as a commander. So we know it was in his nature, he would have done this over and over again. But since he lived under the direction of the Senate, because Rome was still a republic, this harmful quality of his not only was hidden, indeed, it brought him glory. Because the Senate allowed him to avoid the use of compassion when it might have been dangerous, which creates this contradiction between the idea of a leader who's a one-man band for the government, does everything by himself, and the need to have someone to correct their nature, their natural mistakes. So chapter 18 is about honesty, right? About loyalty, and of course, Machiavelli will start by acknowledging that morality is a good thing. How laudable it is in a prince to maintain faith and to live with integrity and not with cleverness, everyone understands. Again, this is not Machiavelli being hypocritical, because of course the rest of the chapter will contradict that, right? Machiavelli will say, in the end, it is harmful to be uh, honest loyal all the time. It is Machiavelli acknowledging that morality exists outside of his system. It may not be relevant within the context of the political game, but morality is there. Morality is valued by society as a whole. And therefore Machiavelli is saying, is telling the reader, I'm not removing morality from the human experience. I'm just telling the leader that it should not be the driving force within the political game. So it is the leader who's allowed to be amoral or immoral, not the citizens, not society as whole, okay? So Machiavelli would never say, cheat and do what you want, no? Nonetheless, one sees from experience in our own times 
Machiavelli always liked to, likes to base everything on reality, real example, historical evidence. The princes who have done great things have held faith of small account, and he may have been thinking about Cesare Borgia and the facts of Senegalia when he invited his enemies and then proceeded to kill them. And they have known how, with their cleverness, to so spin man's brain. Now, this spin man's brain means to manipulate others. The original, I believe, is aggirare. Aggirare means to con, essentially. That, in the end, they have outdone the ones who founded themselves on sincerity. So this is the idea that within a context where a political game is played, any activity, any strategy that the leader engages on in that context cannot be based on moral rules if those rules are not uh, followed by all the players and therefore uh, you are at a disadvantage if you introduce some external and irrelevant boundary in your actions. There are two kinds of combat means, there are two ways to victory, right? You have to sometimes unpack the language of Machiavelli to make it clear. So how do you achieve victory? With laws, meaning following the rules, or with force. The first one is proper to man, meaning Man as a divine creature, right? And the second is proper to beasts, right? So Machiavelli himself is showing that he is aware that the use of force, the use of violence can be criticized, right? But then he says, what is reality according to his view of the political game? Many times the first is not enough to uh, rely on following the rules, uh, compliance with the rules, honesty, faith, loyalty. One must have recourse to the second. You have to sometimes use force. It is necessary to know well how to use both the beast and the man. And this is linked to the literature of medieval short stories and poems where you find this idea of a mature man, a civilized man coming out of his beastly nature, right? And sometimes that happens through love, right? Medieval love is all, uh, courtly love is all uh, about that. And sometimes it happens in chivalric literature through heroic feats. Right? whereby the knight involved in the chivalric literature understand that being a good knight is more than being able to fight. There is a spiritual side that you have to develop. So, the beast and the man, and Machiavelli says, this is clear from tradition, because, for example, the famous hero of the Trojan War, Achilles, was brought up, was trained and educated by this mythical creature, the centaur called Chiron, who was half horse, half man. And this is an allegory of the fact that everyone is part animal, part refined intellect, but within the same creature, within the same body. So Machiavelli is revising the medieval view, you evolve out of your beastly natural state and you become a refined, civilized man from this trope of medieval literature, Machiavelli is saying, no, 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 no. You grow, but you bo you're both animal and refined man. You're both body and mind. And you have to be able to rely more on one or the other as necessary, from which comes this which is the weakest part of Machiavelli's ideology, in my view, this idea that you can simply turn a switch and at some point be all beast and some point be all man. 
without the two compartments of the individual leader affecting each other. And we know instead that, for example, prolonged use of violence generates more often than not post-traumatic stress disorder, even when that use of violence is justified, as in the case of policemen and soldiers, right? So the preceptor, the teacher, the educator of Achilles was half beast, half man. What it means that, it, it means that it is necessary for a prince to know how to use the one and the other nature. So they're two separate compartments, but they coexist in the leader, and you have to be able to turn one or the other on. The one without the other cannot endure, and then he talks about the fox and the lion, right? Where the fox represents the cunning mind. The fox uh, is good with traps. But the fox cannot defend itself from the wolves. And therefore, you also need to be the lion. But as I said at the beginning of my uh, lecture, instead of, we're, it's surprising that instead of saying, well, the lion can attack the wolves, right? Can bite the wolves, uh, can kill the wolves. No, it says, the lion owns the wolves. So essentially, force ends up being not about engaging in an actual fight, but it's about deterrence. The wolves will see the lion, will be paralyzed with fear and turn away. Those who simply stick with the methods of the lion do not understand this, meaning you cannot rely on the traditional concept of the government without manipulation, without influence, you cannot sustain your leadership. So you see here the ambivalence of Machiavelli going back and forth about this in, in this binary view between force and influence what is the most important thing? And Machiavelli seems to be hesitant to commit to one or the other. Depending on the passage, he will do the opposite of the other passages. A prudent lord, therefore, cannot or should he, nor should he observe faith. Where keep in mind that this is more than advocating for evil ways in government. He say, Machiavelli is saying that there is a necessity, there is a logical uh, consequence that you can draw from the observation of politics that sometimes you cannot, even if you wanted to, you cannot observe faith. You cannot be honest all the time. Because sometimes observance, so following the rules, turn against itself, will cause you to fail. Or sometimes reasons that made him promise, give a word of honor, have been eliminated. Okay, so there is no external authority saying, if you gave your word, you should keep it. It's all within the game. If the circumstances force you to give a promise to someone and the circumstances change, then don't keep your word. And you find here another passage connected to the theme of humans are flawed that we discussed throughout the week. If men were all good, this precept would not be good. But because they are wicked and they would not observe faith for you, you too do not have to observe it from them. Which is the acknowledgement that in the end, everyone falls follow follows their own self-interest. But then the issue is, even when you violate the laws of morality, you should not tarnish your image. You should be careful not to ruin your image, which must be family man, uh, outstanding citizen, etc., etc. Nor does a prince ever lack reasons to legitimate the painting over of his non-observance. Right? So, again, we go back to the issue of influence. Influence is connected to your public persona. So, to be a good leader, it is necessary to know how to match this nature well, the, the beastly nature, right? The use of force, manipulation, cunning, and to be a great pretender and dissembler to simulate and dissimulate. And 
works. Machiavelli says it works. You might not think it works because it's so clear that you're not what you pretend to be, that you're hypocritical, yet men are so simple and they so well obey present necessities. Men are so simple and obey present necessities needs to be unpacked. Is Machiavelli saying that people don't care and they have other things to tend to? So they'll just play along because it doesn't affect them in a major way, even if they might doubt that you are what you claim to be, okay? He who deceives will always find someone who will allow himself to be deceived is instead a reference to the view that Machiavelli has of society in general, whereby there are some exceptional, extraordinary individuals and the rest is sheep, the rest is the masses. Uh, a large amount of people who are mediocre when it comes to society. However, keep in mind that this is not if you, if you stop at this kind of consideration, then you simplify in a terrible <coughs> way Machiavelli. Keep in mind that the implication is this is true for society as a whole, but when it comes to the private, personal context of everyone's life, there the citizen <coughs> wants to be in charge. And that's why Machiavelli will insist a lot, don't take their property, don't take their women, which means don't threaten their own leadership in their small circle. But when it comes to the big game of politics, then this is how most people behave. They're gregarious, right? It doesn't mean they're gregarious in everything in their life, because otherwise you don't understand um, how Machiavelli looks at a, a modern capitalistic society. The leadership is, that is applied by individuals to their own small context does not extend to the larger political game, because most people don't have the talents, the skills, or the desire for such game, right? Which would be like saying, most people don't want to enter politics, they might be honest, they might be uh, reliable, trustworthy, uh, smart, etc. but they, a lot of people just say, I, I don't want to run for, for office. Thus, it is not necessary for a prince actually to have all of the above written qualities, but it is very necessary to seem to have them, right? It's all, it's all about appearances. In fact, Machiavelli is so convinced that he also goes the opposite way. When these qualities are possessed and always observed, they are harmful. Because at some point, the leader will have to be dishonest, will have to play dirty, in order to guarantee the outcome, and that outcome is important. When they seem to be possessed, they're useful. Because if it is all appearances, then you can more easily switch from one mindset, one uh, kind of practice to another. So, it is useful to seem compassionate, faithful, kind, honest, religious, was faithful is moral and religious is following the, uh, the values and the rules of Christian religion, and to be so. But to stay in a manner so constructed in your spirit that if it is necessary, necessity is, is the factor here, not to be these things, you are able and know how to become the contrary. But is it really that easy to switch from one mindset to another. Then, of course, Machiavelli makes a particular case for a new prince because he pays a lot of attention to exceptional circumstances for a new prince because what he has in mind is the new prince that would save Italy from the present political and military crisis. And for a new prince, the recommendation of Machiavelli is not be honest at all, because you'll need to act quickly, and force is the quicker remedy to the crisis. So in terms of appearances, take great care that nothing ever escape his mouth that is not full of the five qualities stated above, and that he appear to those who hear him and observe him 
all compassion, all faith, all integrity, all kindness, all religion, and there is nothing more important than religion itself, where Machiavelli is being ironic, right? Especially because he despised religion and he despised the clergy uh, in particular. Many general judge with their eyes and with their hands, as it's like talking about this is perfectly ap applicable to the media society. You judge based on what you see, not on your direct experience, direct evidence. Touch here means your direct uh, access to direct evidence. And then even those who are not many who understand that you're false, right? That your image is just uh, a construction, don't oppose you because you have on your side influence, the majesty of the state, right? Who am I to go against the president? I may think the president is crook, but I cannot, as an individual, uh, take risks in society. And then here, you find the famous passage that inspired the maxim the end, the, the, the ends justify the means, right? Machiavelli, in fact, never expressed the concept in those words. He just said, one looks to the end. Meaning, you look at the outcome. Because the outcome is the important thing, both for the leader and for the society that depends on that leader. And you do whatever you need to to achieve that outcome. Whatever you need to, the necessity that is induced by the context may include even things that are normally considered evil, dishonest, immoral, etc. But you do it for the benefit of the outcome, which eventually is the benefit of the community. And you can see how, from this kind of ideology, you have the system known as reason of state. Let a prince act so as to win and maintain his state means to conquer and to maintain control. And then the consequence of control is order and stability, security in society. And this is appreciated by everyone. So this should be judged honorable, praised by everyone, if you can ensure that outcome. It doesn't matter how you did it. The masses are always captivated by appearances, so you can influence them by pretending not to be evil and by the outcome of the thing, right? Because if the outcome is positive for society, they will recognize that and they will support the leader. They will not look at how the outcome was achieved. And in the world, there are only the masses, meaning when it comes to society, the skills of leadership are limited to just a few extraordinary individuals in the, in the view of Machiavelli. The few have no standing when the many have someone to uh, support them, okay? Where the few is the reference to possible competitors and usually it's the oligarchy, it's, it's the other uh, powerful groups in society which are limited in terms of numbers. It's almost the time, so I'll stop here.